Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in the Harvard Classic Lectures. This is lecture number 55 from um, the Emerson Collection, uh, the 1836 uh, uh, book-length essay, Nature. Now this one is not actually in the Harvard Classics, but I've elected to do it as an additional lecture. Um, the, uh, uh, when Dr. Elliott put together the, the selections for volume number five, he didn't include this one. And uh, I think that's probably, you know, always going to be the debate, why would you include some essays and not others? We said in a last lecture that he would include English traits, but not this one. So we're going to spend some time now with this one. Many have argued, and I think rightfully so, that this is probably Emerson's most important essay, which is why I think we need to at least include it, even though it's technically not in the Harvard Classics. Now, if you haven't been following my lectures, you need to get to LearnStrong.net. Go down that left-hand side, find the uh, Harvard Classics folder, and at least watch lecture number 35, our introduction to Emerson, where we said we want to study Emerson as person... Uh, teacher, that's our first perspective. Two, we want to study Emerson from the perspective of philosopher, idealist, sometimes referred to as transcendentalist. It's a term, transcendentalist, that actually was used in aspersion at first and then was uh, was kind of co-opted and, and adopted by uh, many of the philosophers. Emerson himself didn't often like this term. He liked idealists much better. And then finally we'll look at Emerson as artist and creator, uh, what we call to be in our in our reading theory. Remember, our learning theory is the capacity to connect new information to old information, those three levels of reading. We're always looking at this essay and all texts from the three questions. What does the text say? What does the text mean? That is to say, 2A themes, messages, 2B rhetoric, not what Emerson says, but how he says it. And then finally, how can I relate to this text in 3A? How do I relate to other texts into the world? And then finally, how do I relate to uh, myself personally? Let's do some quick background information here just to make sure we're all on board. Um, I think that in many ways it's true to say what many Emerson scholars have said, that much of the foundations of Emersonian transcendentalism is all kind of here in this essay. After visiting the Museum of Natural uh, History in Paris, um, he lectures, Emerson lectures, and then finally publishes what becomes this essay. Emerson will divide in this essay nature into four usages. Commodity, which he'll refer to as basic needs, Beauty, which is the desire, of course, um, um, for delight. Language, which is, of course, communication. And finally, discipline, um, the understanding of the world. Um, and then, uh, I think in many ways you could make the argument that American Scholar will follow the publishing of, of this one in 1836. And in many ways, that really does just launch his career. Now, um, it, it, the, our work does come to an end with our study of Emerson with this one, so I want to enjoy really um, seeing the roots of all the ideas that we've, been, that we've been working with. And unfortunately, as we've said before, I can't read all of this, but I'll try, and do, I'll try and do as much as I can. Let's do a quick, brief overview for those of us who are studying this essay and kind of need this information. First, there's an intro of four paragraphs. Then we have chapter one of six paragraphs. That one's untitled. Chapter 2, finally, is titled Commodity, and we have five paragraphs there. Beauty to follow at Chapter 3 with 12 paragraphs. That's one of the longer chapters. And chapter 4, Language, with 13 paragraphs. <clears throat> and then Chapter 5, Discipline, with 18 paragraphs. That, along with Chapter 6, Idealism, with also 18 paragraphs, are the two longest chapters. And then finally, Spirit, with eight paragraphs at, uh, for Chapter 7. And then finally, Chapter 8, prospe uh, Prospects, with 12 paragraphs, so a total of 96 paragraphs for those of you that are kind of uh, doing it, um, keeping notes that way. Um, some important ideas. He's going to make the argument that solitude is more important than community. Um, he's going to make the argument that a man or an individual is greater than a group of people or, a, or, or, a, or, a, or men. Of course, that nature is the great teacher. We're going to hear this one a lot. And then finally, going back to that uh, information that I shared before from Plato's Republic Book 6, and the idea of the notion of the theory of the forms, where we have our two boxes. Uh, in the first box, we can put a beautiful person or a beautiful body. In the second box, we will put the concept of beauty. Of course, you can't touch the stuff in the second box as concepts, can you, right? So, for example, we can talk about an, um, um, uh, money in the first box, and we can talk about value in the second box, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
Um, he will make it this. Uh, he will say it this way: um, that the the idea of nature in the first box is nature with a lowercase n. That's what we would say Ruthie's tree. But then there's nature in the second box, which is nature with a capital N, right? And here, um, this one is is what sometimes we'll refer to as energy, sometimes referred to as spirit or soul, the universal being, sometimes referred to as God. When Emerson, as we've said in earlier lectures, when Emerson's talking about nature in this way, though, he's not talking about a personal deity, but rather a transpersonal deity, as we've said in earlier lectures. One way he says this is, the happiest man is he who learns from nature the lesson of worship. That is to say, the moral sentiment, and we'll, we'll be talking quite a bit about that one. Now, Emerson has three big questions that he's going to address in this essay. What is matter? Whence is it? And where to? And his argument will be that nature works through humans to accomplish its goal. All right, let's turn now to the essay itself. And right away, the intro deserves, I think, some close attention. So let's play that game right away. He began in 1836, this essay, he published two different times. In 1836, he began with a quote from Plotinus um, that said, Nature is but an image or an imitation of wisdom. The um, last thing of the soul, nature being a thing which um, uh, do, um, uh, that doth only do but not know. The argument here being that nature has no personality of its own. In the second publishing in 1849, um, there's a little poem of his that he, uh, he took out the Plotinus and he put his, a subtle chain of countless rings, the next unto the farthest brings, the eye reads omens where it goes and speaks all languages the rose, and striving to be man, the worm mounts through all the, sp all the spires of form, the idea of evolution. Let's, uh, let's point out that Darwin's Origin of Species won't be published until 1859. This is an interesting idea. And now to the introduction. Our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchres of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We, through their eyes, why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should we not have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition, so many of the Emersonian ideas here introduced already, and a religion by revelation to us, and not the history of theirs. Embosomed for a season in nature, whose floods of life stream around and through us, and invite us by the powers they supply to action proportionated to nature. Why should we grope among the dry bones of the past, or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe. The sun shines today also. There's more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. Um, he, he will say in paragraph three of the introduction that the most abstract truth is the most practical, which is, of course, going to be a fascinating concept, right, and one that we'll have to grapple with at times. Um, as we move now into chapter uh, number one. All right, let's, let's make some, some note comments, and then we'll come back to some uh, of our favorite lines. I don't have time to be able to go paragraph by paragraph as, as I've done in earlier lectures, but we'll work quickly. He begins in chapter one, again untitled, by pointing out that the poet is important because he integrates all that he sees. Uh, let's remind ourselves, of course, that Again, Emerson will use the language of his day, the pronoun of his day, he meaning all humans. Today he would use gender-inclusive language, obviously, right? He talks in chapter 1 about the power of seeing stars, rediscovering the eternal. He talks about two major themes, progress and accessibility. Um, we take the stars for granted, he says. From stars and landscape, he says, nature somehow integrates everything, right? And the poet then can see differently. This notion of perspicacity, of insight, taking us all the way back to the Greek notion that you have the gods who are immortal and know everything, you have humans which are obviously immortal and know nothing, and then in between, as we said in an earlier lecture, you have the power of the artist, the poet, who is then going to be able to share the important information, right? He says a child accepts nature for what it is, and we immediately think about Ten Turn uh, and Ten Turn Abbey. Um, he says in the woods, this is paragraph four of chapter one. It's a famous paragraph, so a famous set of lines. In the woods we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, 
all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. This is the famous transparent eyeball line. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or, part of soul, or particle of God. The name of the nearest friend sounds then foreign and accidental. To be brothers, to be acquaintances. Master or servant is then a trifle and a disturbance. I'm the lover of uncontained and immortal beauty. In the wilderness, I find something more dear and conate than in streets or villages. Again, one of the famous Emersonian dichotomies. So much better to be out in the wilderness instead of being stuck in the city. In the tranquil landscape, and especially in the distant line of the horizon, man beholds somewhat as beautiful as his own nature. Nature, in other words, does not have a personality that it alone devises. Humans personify nature. All right, let's quickly go now to chapter 2, and commodity is the title of this one. Com commodity here just simply means physical necessity, if you want to write that one down. Nature supports us. The natural process, an evolutionary process, all nature works together to improve us as humans. This will be the origination of his idea of moral sentiment. And this is why humans create art. The, um, the uh, line that, that I'll read here um, for you is from paragraph 4 of chapter 2, and it runs like this. By the aggregate of these aids, how is the face of the world changed? From the era of Noah to that of Napoleon. It's a great, I mean, it's a great uh, line, and as we've said before, it to be, Emerson is great with his lines. Chapter 3 is titled, Beauty. Beauty is more important than the commodity, right? Because beauty implants in us a noble want, a desire, and, of course, nature, therefore, provides us with restorative powers. We think of Ten Turn Abbey, Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey, in our comments there. Of course, the best way to describe this understanding and this relationship of beauty vis-a-vis -vis the, the nature is the circle. Of course, he talks as well about the landscape. And the perfect order, remember our comments here from the essay circles, there is a unity between eye and light. There are three points in terms of our use of beauty that he wants to make. One, medicinal qualities, right? That is to say, passively losing self, consciously seeking healing, right? Is Passively losing oneself is uh, more important than consciously seeking healing. In other words, to just go out for a walk in the woods and not be there for a specific reason is better than going out and looking for something. Uh, point two, spiritual elements. This is... Harmony with nature's beauty. Nature rewards those whose thoughts are noble. Again, that notion of the moral sentiment. And finally, number three, intellectual properties. We seek perfection, and ultimately we find it in nature, i.e. God. Now again, when we talk about God here, we're not talking about some kind of understanding of a personal deity, but rather a transpersonal deity. This leads to taste, and the, this, the distinction between taste and art. Taste is the love of beauty. Art is the creation of beauty. And finally, he ends chapter 3 by saying the sum of nature is greater than its parts. I'm going to jump into just a few comments um, here. Let's begin in paragraph number 2. Even the corpse has its own beauty. Paragraph number 3. We are never tired so long as we can see far enough. What a great line. Paragraph number 4. He says it this way. The dawn is my Assyria. The sunset and moonrise my pathos. And unimaginable realms of fairy. Broad noon shall be my England of the senses and the understanding. The night shall be my Germany of mystic philosophy and dreams. Um, and then in paragraph number eight, he says it this way, beauty is the mark God sets upon virtue. In paragraph nine, he says, nothing divine dies. We immediately think of earlier lectures. We talked about energy, that which can be neither created nor destroyed. All good is eternally reproductive. The beauty of nature reforms itself in the mind, and not for barren contemplation, but for new creation. And then finally, in paragraph uh, 12, he says it this way, No reason can be asked or given why the soul seeks beauty. Beauty, in its largest and profoundest sense, is one expression for the universe. God is the all-fair. Truth and goodness and beauty are but different faces of the same. The good, the true, the beautiful, the big three, as we talked about it in an earlier lecture. Chapter 4, he calls language. Here, he says, words represent objects in nature. These objects signify spiritual realities. And, of course, these words that represent objects in nature symbolize spirituality. 
He goes to etymology, word origins and development, and he talks about how concepts are derived from concrete objects. So for example, back to our two boxes, right? The first box is the physical, the second box is the metaphysical, that which is beyond. Think about it. So in the first box we would put the wind, in the second box we will put spirit. In the first box we will put heart, right? The physical heart in your chest. But of course this represents a concept called emotion. The head, of course, in the first box, representing reason. This is the way, he says, our language develops. Nature supplies then our language, he says. A river, obviously, we look at a river, we think about the passage of time. Seasons, stages of human growth. Emerson's assumption here is that all these correspondences that we all agree on lead to some notion of universal morals. This has, of course, been the subject of hot debate in Emersonian thought. I mean, is it legitimate? Is it not legitimate that everybody actually knows what's right and what's wrong? Somehow, he says, we're all connected. That is to say, soul, spirit, through nature, right? And therefore, the source of all morals. The problem, of course, is we forget about nature. The world is too much with us, you'll remember Wordsworth said. Of course, Wordsworth and, and, um, and Emerson met, right? Money matters more than uh, nature. Stuff matters more than nature. Um, and then he says it. New imagery ceases to be created. Human laws, he says, mimic nature's laws. Laws of physics will actually lead to laws of moral conduct. And by degrees, he says, the world becomes an open book. Let's jump into a few lines from chapter, um, from chapter 4, language. Um, in paragraph number 1, he says, words are signs of natural facts. In paragraph 3, he says, who looks upon a river in a meditative hour and is not reminded of the flux of all things? We think of Heraclitus and, and his notion of you never can step into the same river twice, right? In uh, paragraph number 7, he says, he says this, he says, hence... Good writing and brilliant discourse are perpetual allegories. This imagery is spontaneous. It is the blending of experience with the present action of the mind. It is proper creation. It is the working of the original cause through the instruments he has already made. Of course, we've often said that this is what makes good writing and good speaking, that ability to connect somehow an, a, a word picture with a concept, right? And then, it's, and then it becomes profound. He says in paragraph 8, we know more from nature than we can at will communicate. Why does a sunset move us? Sometimes it's beyond our comprehension to even express it, right? Paragraph 9, he says, we are like travelers using the cinders of a volcano to roast their eggs. What a great line. And then he says in paragraph 9 as well, because parts of speech are metaphors, because the whole of nature is a metaphor of the human mind. And in many ways, that's a line, I mean, you can write that one down, the whole of nature is a metaphor for the human mind. By paragraph number 11, he says it this way, it is the standing problem which, is which has exercised the wonder and the study of every fine genius since the world began, from the era of the Egyptians and the Brahmins to that of Pythagoras, of Plato, of Bacon, of Leibniz, of, Swin of Swedenborg. There sits the, sp the Sphinx at the roadside, and from age to age, as every prophet comes by, he tries his fortune at reading her riddle. There seems to be a necessity in spirit to manifest itself in material forms in day and night. River and storm, beast and bird, acid and alkali, pre-exist and necessary ideas in the mind of God and are what they are by virtue of preceding affections in the world of spirit. This idea then um, is compelling the visual creation is the terminus or the circumference of the invisible world. They are, symbi they are symbiotic, in other words. Well, the obvious question is, so far, do you buy this idea? Are we all really born with this idea of the moral sentiment? What are your thoughts? Why or, or why not? Let's keep going. Chapter 5, he calls it discipline. We use understanding and reason to know nature. Nature, he says, provides lessons we can learn. Think of Ruthie's tree as a classic example. How many times in my, in my lectures over Emerson and other, other uh, lectures as well, but over Emerson, have we referenced Ruthie's tree out there in the, in the courtyard, right? Understanding is what he calls how natural objects are different and the same. He talks about debt and property, um, and he says that neither of these should matter as much as they do because natural objects, he says, lead to, uh, today to social economic issues. 
And, and here's an interesting question to ask. Is Emerson maybe a little too harsh here? Um, he knew bad debt, and he understood what it was like at times to be without, without resources. He says it shouldn't matter. Um, then he speaks about will as power over nature. We mold nature into what is useful for us. We shape nature. And he talks about understanding as knowledge of how objects function in the world, reason as the intuition needed to understand these objects, right? Obviously, this definition of reason is different from our definition today, which we usually maybe think more of as logic. For Emerson, then, moral and ethical sentiment. And he says it this way, the fisherman learns to be firm by looking at the sea-beaten rocks. All things, he says, in nature produce some kind of singular whole, right? And that is to say, and that explains why humans should be united around that moral sentiment. Go back to our comments on uh, Plato's Republic. Do you remember when we made that observation about there's the beginning and then there's the ascension and then there's the decline? What is it that for Plato leads to the ascension of a group of people and it is what? Harmony, unity. Here we are with, uh, with Emerson saying the same thing. Um, this is why then the circle matters, right? Um, because in a circle there is no beginning and there is no ending. Let's jump into a few of the lines from chapter 5 and see and just, and just hear some of the amazing stuff. He says it this way, To instruct us, he says, that good thoughts are no better than good dreams unless they be executed. Well, remember that Thoreau said at the conclusion of Walden, it, it's okay if you've built castles in the air, now put the foundations under them, remember he said. At paragraph number 7 he says, Nature's dice are always loaded. Emerson loves this line. This notion of cause and effect is being central to how we understand the world. In paragraph 12 he says, A thing is good only so far as it serves. The pragmatic utilitarian Emerson, right? Uh, in um, in uh, paragraph 13 he says it this way, What is a farm but a mute gospel? What a great line. And who can guess how much firmness the sea-beaten rock has taught the fisherman? Um, a line we were referencing a few seconds ago. In